Hello everyone, happy new year. Welcome to 2019. Um, my name is Casey Smith and I am one of the co-founders of State Matters, which is a um, group that works with artists to create content that, that explains how the heck state and local government works here in Illinois. And I'm also a 2019 fellow with Chicago United for Equity. And this beautiful woman here, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, you're so kind. Um, hello everyone, I'm so excited to be here. You have no idea how Shack Knight has um, inspired a lot of the work that I do. I'm an architectural, an architectural and urban designer. Um, I'm an import to Chicago, I've been here seven years, and I, um, I founded an urban design studio called Borderless uh, about two and, a, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, I also wear many hats, like many of you folks here. Um, I co-host um, a thing called City Open Workshop, which is basically what you guys have here, but uh, oriented into city design and city planning. So uh, we are constantly looking at Chad Hagnats as an inspiration, as a model, and I'm, I'm really excited to be back here. Um, I also been working lately um, in research about all the closed Chicago public schools um, with the big closings of 2013. And that's what led me into be one of the um, Q Fellows 2019 as well. Yeah, I also like Shy Hack Night, but whatever. Thanks for showing <laughs> me up there, Paula. It's fine. Um, so we thought it might be worthwhile to tell you a little bit about what Chicago United for Equity is, since some of you may not have heard of it. Um, so it's an organization um, here in Chicago that is dedicated to race equity in Chicago and improving race equity. You may have heard, or maybe not, Chicago is a horrifically um, segregated and inequitable city, and we are trying to do work to change that, and all of us have a role to play in that. Um, so here is the mission statement. I'm going to read it. Chicago United for Equity, working to build a city that is just, equitable, and inclusive. That means we have a city that feels fair and works for all of us, no matter our skin color. Um, so the way that they do that is through a couple, um, they're really doing a lot of different types of work. One of the things is definitely focusing on schools. Um, last year they had a project that was rallying to encourage people and empower them and help them run for local school councils as a place that's really at the kind of ground floor of where a lot of these conversations about equity can start and where an impact can be made. But they work in all neighborhoods and work with um, civic leaders, policy makers, elected representatives, community organizers, a lot of different types of folks. And one of the things that they do. Can I give a shout out to a project? Um, so does everyone here have, or anyone he's ha here has heard of the latest news on the National Teachers Academy from last month? South Loop. South school. Loop. School closing or? Oh, great. Look it up. Google it. Some great news for your 2019. It's, uh, all here I'm going to go. say is an unprecedented case study in which um, Chicago Public Schools uh, um, we're going, to, we're going to close this elementary school in order to make it into a campus, a part of a larger school. The elementary school they were going to close was majority black and brown students. Um, and that was actually what birthed Chicago United for Equity was that fight from that um, local school council to keep that school open. And they ended up winning that fight um, and a judge ruled that they were actually, like the, the thing that it came down to was that closing the school was actually um, a discriminatory against the students that were there. And so CPS backed off and now the school gets to continue to exist. And it's unprecedented to win a lawsuit against CPS, Chicago Public Schools. So that's a major project that Chicago United for Equity led in the last couple of years through organizing, community organizing at the, at the forefront of it. And we may have bungled a couple of those details, so please look it up. There's some really great reporting on it, so definitely check out that full story because it's really impressive. I think the tagline for that was also, it was not, it, they told us it was a done deal. And when they were told that, I think it's important to reflect on like the power that we're gonna talk about here or what inspired our work um, with Q is that, that we all have a power for change. Yeah. So the fellowship program is a nine month program with 30 fellows and these fellows come from all different sectors. So public sector, private sector, and also their community organizers. And we are representing our organizations, our companies, our community groups, our government agencies that we work for 
in a race equity project within our organization or company, and then we also work together collectively on race equity projects throughout the city over the course of that nine months. If I, a small shout out, we're about four months in. It's been a really, really amazing experience. We've met a lot of amazing people and are doing some really interesting work. If this is something that you think within your organization or your company that it might be something that would be helpful, or if it's something where you feel like your organization or company maybe like is talking the talk on race equity, but not necessarily walking the walk, this might be something to talk to them about, trying to do the fellowship the program with Q because it also is just really great resources for especially you know mid to larger size companies that maybe don't quite know what race equity actually looks like in practice. Um, we have another Q fellows in the back. Shout out to Kendra and Tambi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah. You can talk to them as well if you're interested in what is this fellowship thing. Okay. Moving yes. on. So that is essentially what Q is and why we are standing here as representatives of it. Representatives of it. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about what racial equity is, Paola? Take it away. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, we all think about racial equity in different ways, and the way that I've, I'm trying to speak about it the most lately is how can your skin color or the place you live define your quality of life or your outcome as a citizen, as a person. So I want to give you a little tiny task. Um, and it's, it's a part of a reflection. It's part of a introspection. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of data points after this. But I want you to think of a story, of a personal story or experience that links your story with some of the data that I'm going to show. And the reason for that is that um, what could you guess about two groups of Chicagoans if you heard that? On average, one of them has more highly rated schools in their neighborhood. One group spends less time traveling to get to work. One group lives longer than the other. That might not mean anything to you particularly, but let's talk about disparities. Let's talk about inequities by the numbers. I know you folks are very data oriented, so let's talk about numbers. We also like, um, this is not our work by any means. This is data and investigation and research that has been done by other organizations, uh, such as the Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance, the Metropolitan Planning Council, University of Illinois, Chicago Institute for Research um, on Race and Public Policy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to think of an experience, a personal experience or someone close to you that has been a reflection of this. For instance, in housing, the median value of homes is 275,000 for white owned, 180,000 for Latino, Latinas owned, um, and 145,000 black owned. Disparities, right? We're all we're just documenting disparities. Uh, the fact here also is homes in majority black neighborhoods are valued at 28% less than similar homes in comparable neighborhoods with less than 1% black residents. Gonna let that settle for a moment. Economic development. Since 1960, family income has increased 39.1% for white Chicagoans, 12.8% for Latinx Chicagoans, has decreased 1.1% for black Chicagoans. Education, 10 years after starting high school in, in Chicago public schools, this is the percentage of students who completed a bachelor's degree. Men, women, white, Latinx, black. So we're going from the 27 to the 36 percentage, 11, 16. Wow, women do really well. I wonder why. Yeah, it's like not after we <laughs> um, inequities, right? We're, just, we're focusing on inequities, but also gender inequity is important to um, highlight. Justice. This was very shocking to me. And we know about it, but when you see the number, it's really dramatic. Data on Chicago Police Department stops conducted from May to August 2014 shows that stops involved 72% of black people. 
17% of Latinx people, 9% white people. Numbers don't lie, right? They're telling us something. Health, um, in terms of health, health rates from 2014 show that infant mortality per 1,000 lived births for this racial groups of Chicago was um, higher for, for black folks. So before we move to this part, can anyone just share, I'm gonna, I'm gonna instigate this a little bit in the group, can anyone share one personal story that relates to those numbers? A friend, a colleague, a, f a family member that you find related to those kind of inequities? I'm gonna let you think about it. We're gonna come back to that. But think like, when was the last time you were pulled by a cop? Or when was the last time that you're looking for affordable housing in your neighborhood? Or when was the last time that you and your friends talk about at graduation rates within your circle? All right, I'm gonna pass it to Casey. All right, um, so the Vote Equity Project is a project that we're working on. Um, a bunch of the fellows are working together for this project, and this is specifically looking at the mayoral election that was mentioned earlier that's happening on February 26th. So, um, what the Vote Equity Project is doing is it's taking ideas specifically related to race equity. So these are actionable I, policy ideas. These are structural changes. This is TIF reform. This is elected school board, right? This is investing in mental health. Uh, this is, it, these are really, really specific ideas to get to the heart of some of these inequalities. Um, and the first thing that happened with the, this campaign is we collected all of those ideas from people who were submitting them online, advocacy organizations, um, policy, research, kind of think tanks. A lot of people that have been working in this space presented and, and um, submitted those ideas. And then those all got vetted and the ones that ended up making it through were over 200. So over 200 ideas for, for policy changes that would address race equity. Now, the part of the project that we're in now is we want everyone to vote on them. And so why we're voting on them is to prioritize which of those 200 ideas kind of rise to the top of what we want to focus on in 2019. This doesn't mean that, that some of the ideas are actually, you know, we don't need to do those, we only need to do these. We probably need to do most all of them, but these are just the ones that we're gonna focus in for right now. And once we finish that, that round of voting, which ends January 31st, and we're gonna be doing some of that tonight, um, the top ideas will then be going to all of our mayoral candidates, and we'll be creating a race equity voter guide, so you'll be able to see how all of these candidates feel about these specific policy issues. And this is something for me that, you know, people can say that they support black and brown people, they can say that they like black and brown people, but when it comes down to actual policies, that's when you actually see what people are really thinking, right? Like that's when you see what they're all about because I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of sick of like thoughts and prayers when it comes to black and brown communities and not actual like ideas being implemented and invested in that actually addresses the problems that we all know exist here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so there are a lot of different organizations that have helped bring this project through. Uh, these are a couple of them. Uh, Grassroots Collaborative, Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, Generation All, UIC, and the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, and they've been really core partners involved in this for the last many, many months, bringing this all together. Um, and from a little, a little point, from looking through all of these different policy reform ideas, there were a couple major trends that I think are interesting. One, a lot of them relate to who holds the power. So who holds the decision-making power in certain communities and over specific things in those communities? Um, how and where city dollars are spent, kind of related to the first one, who's making those decisions, and then where is that money going and who is able to kind of hold that money accountable? Who benefits from development, speaking specifically about development in different neighborhoods and communities and whether or not that's then kind of enriching the community that's already there or if that's enriching a different community. 
um, and what we deserve from our city, looking at kind of getting back to the basics, basic needs, education, safety, transit, um, and health. Health is another big one that showed up in there. Um, this is a little map thinking about voter turnout, um, which kind of unsurprisingly ends up lining up a lot with the investment in the city. So lower voter turnout are in different wards and parts of the city that also have been historically not invested in. Um, so if any of, if you have any contacts, friends, folks, colleagues, family members in the red part, talk to us. We really want to reach out to everyone that it's not doing well representing or casting your vote in that map. Mm -hmm. So how to get involved. Um, this survey ballot for um, all of these different race equity ideas is online. Chicagoforall.org is where you can access the online. We also have it available on paper. What? Yes. We have paper voting, like Scantron style. It's awesome. We have a lot of them here. So what you can do is host a party. What does a party look like? Paola? <laughs> <laughs> Two people is already a party. Hey. Right? You well, but the more, the more the merrier, right? <laughs> this is uh, some of our very, um, we call it the vote party, vote equity party tour. If you go to the website, uh, Chicago for all slash party dates, um, there are many of this um, events already line up. Maybe check it out, maybe some, one of them, it's in your neighborhood. But um, the parties are basically conversations. In our conversations where we have this type of discussion, we talk about data, but we also sit down and discuss these ideas. Uh, some of them are really familiar to us. Some other people don't know what a TIF is or how it, it functions. So it's an opportunity also to exchange information. Some of us know more of one topic. I don't know much about, um, I don't know, um, education, which I should know more since I'm researching schools. But I think this parties are an opportunity um, to exchange information among ourselves and get us informed about the decisions that we're about to make when voting our elected um, officials. Um, so we have designed, or the, the team has, has designed, put a lot of resources online. Um, it hasn't been easy for me to have this conversation, so they created a racial equity 101 guide, um, and this is just uh, some resources to get you comfortable talking about this. It doesn't happen instantly, but we can also uh, be there. Um, if you reach out to uh, us, we can also be part of your party, and we always love to hang out <laughs> with folks, but it's also part of our training. We just want to get better at this. We're just going to get comfortable and stronger and more confident uh, having these dialogues and conversations. Yeah, I mean, so I would say on the party front, sometimes parties are really, you know, ooh, it's scary and social commitments. Um, but this could also be something that you get your coworkers together over lunch, you know, something that you already do on a regular basis. It doesn't need to be like, there doesn't need to be streamers, there doesn't need to be a cheese plate, you know what I mean? There could be, but there doesn't have to be. Um, so take the word party loosely, right? The real purpose of this is we're trying to get as many people to weigh in on this ballot as possible. And one of the ways is for you all to use your amazing powers of peer pressure to get more people to do that. And this also opens up the opportunity to have a discussion about race equity, which I'm going to guess is probably something that a lot of us don't necessarily have often enough in our lives with our circles, with our you know board game groups, or whatever your social life looks like. Um, that's what my social life looks like. Um, so this is the website, though. You can also just share this online, tweet it, send it out on the gram, send it out on the Facebook, that sort of stuff. Get more people to vote online as well. Um, and we want to, I don't know how much time we have. I have no idea. I haven't, I haven't tracked. But you know, you can do this on your phone. We kind of figured y'all be in the tech savvy group. You probably didn't want the paper version, though. I don't know. Maybe there's like a nostalgia there. Um, the paper versions, by the way, if you want to take some for a party and take them away with you, Sophia, back here in, in this beautiful yellow cardigan, um, waving her hand, has party packets. So if you want to take something with you, please feel, feel, feel free to go grab her, not literally, but uh, verbally. And grab a packet from her. Um, 
Cool. What else? So I think we can open it to questions to folks. What I'm, do you think? I'm fine with that. Okay. Yeah. What are some ways that you are already reaching out to areas that your own networks maybe didn't immediately have access to or areas where you didn't immediately have connections? Well, being, we're being very creative. A <laughs> uh, couple, of, couple of ways. Uh, one is we all, well, at least um, most of the fellows have some form of neighborhood connection. So um, I worked in Englewood or Bronzeville or Pilsen, so reaching to immediate organizations that I've worked in the past you know, sometimes you don't have to create a new event or like a new uh, gathering. You just crash the party, basically. <laughs> um, during holiday season, I was very successful since there was a lot of parties happening. Um, but that's, you know, that's one. Just uh, meet people where they are. And we've been doing that, identifying events. Uh, there's a parallel event right now happening in Logan Square. We kind of took the loop area. There's another event uh, being uh, hosted by the Logan Square Neighborhood um, Association, um, and we're just trying to get into the neighborhoods. Remember that map? That's our, that's our target um, communities. But it doesn't mean that we're not tapping into our own um, work connections, professional connections, personal connections with all organizations that are in neighborhoods. I am currently working um, also with a group of teens from Brighton Park, from the John Hancock High School, in a bus. We are designing a bus to go into an equity tour. So the teens are gonna design this bus, uh, small bus, then school bus, think of the smaller kind of the big one. Uh, but we're designing a bus that could have um, a booth where people can record messages to the next mayor. We are uh, including the bus activities such as um, the voting, the analog voting on paper, because you know there's a lot of, a lot of folks that are not um, tech savvy like most of you here. Um, we're also um, doing some um, voting education uh, in other communities that are not um, as familiar, especially immigrant communities. Um, a lot of the neighborhoods that you saw in red, they're um, Hispanic uh, majority. So obviously all our materials are gonna be bilingual. So there's a lot of creativity going on um, in a lot of this efforts to get the, the word out and encouraging people to vote. So again, we're doing, we're tapping into our assets, our network assets, but also being creative in, in connecting with groups that we wouldn't consider in the first place. I work with youth, but not high school youth. So this is new for me as well. Um, can I still do the story thing? Is that, is that an open thing to do? Cool. Uh, hi. Um, yeah. Uh, my name's Najee. I'm from here, Chicago. I'm from Beverly, if anyone knows where that is cool, some people don't. Hey, lit. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, when you were like going over all this information and talking about equity, especially within like community centered, like with black people, Latinx individuals, it really um, struck many chords within me, specifically because my mom is like, has been an educator all of my life and has mostly worked within like administration within Chicago Bub School Districts. Uh, and my father has been a sergeant for most of my life. So I'm kind of like within the two extremes of like Chicago, like local things and things of that nature. And I remember um, basically all of my child rearing and growing up seeing like the examples of how those two like black bodies and like people navigate spaces like that that are dominated by like white pres presences and opinions and authorities and initiatives, um, which was stressful uh, to watch in general. Um, speaking of my mom's perspective, I remember everything that she did working on the South Side at public schools, for instance, like uh, Gompers, Fine, Gompers Fine Arts Academy, Horace Mann, John Hope, all of these academies she's like been through in her like existence and career. She is always like either being a principal or assistant principal, worked very hard giving her own like money, time, efforts, um, just overexerting herself to a point where she was like literally exhausted to like no end to like provide a safer and like more nurturing environment for like these kids who weren't being supported by like their local governments or anyone at all. So I always think of my mom as like not only a mother to me, but all of these other students as well. She would like literally take them to our home, like um, help them out with their homework, like look after the kids that they had while they were in school. Like she was just like doing everything that she could to like support these kids who were all black in these like schools on the South Side who had no one else to like turn to and no government assistance and no like initiative or anything to like deliver balance or like 
help or like anything to them whatsoever. So like when you talk about equity, when you talk about specifically like Chicago public schools, they're just like, there's so much need for it. And also like existing within those spaces with her, she would often take me to work because I was a lonely child. Um, it was like, she wasn't the only black woman who was like making this work. And it was weird because like black women have been like the healers in these spaces when black women are also like the lowest on like the societal totem pole of like equity and equality. So like when these women who are societally so low are like trying so hard to like embrace and enrich and like help and empower these children who basically have nothing to look forward to like because the world has told them not to. Um, for y'all to be here, for y'all to be making this difference is really important. And like my dad is like literally a sergeant who like um, is in charge of like firing individuals he sees mentally unfit within the Chicago Police Department. So that also like uh, rings really true for equity and balance as well for me. So like y'all doing this means a lot to me coming from a person who has seen like my black parents work really hard to like instill equity within the world and seeing you two like do this work and seeing these people here even though y'all might not have been expecting this is also really important. I'm gonna give this mic back now, good night. Thank you so much for sharing. I feel like um, in our workshops, in our training sessions, we use both data, numbers, and narratives. And I think the numbers tell one part of the story. Unless you hear it from someone else, you really understand what, are the, what is the impact in a person's life to live with those inequities, like day to day. So thank you so much for sharing. So one of the hard parts for me in approaching equity issues in Chicago as someone who's from another state is that a lot of these issues are like legacy issues and it's so embedded in uh, Chicago history and American political history. Um, you've talked about uh, numbers and narratives. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, you address the historical context of these issues or um, strategies that you found effective in uh, kind of bringing these stories uh, to bear? As a fellow transplant, I will take this question, which is a really difficult question. Um, so I moved here from Texas, well, I'm from Texas originally. I moved here via Michigan. Um, yeah, you're from Texas too? What part? I'm from outside Fort Worth. Oh my God, okay, we'll talk later, we'll talk later. Okay, um, and I think that I, I don't, have an exact answer to your question, so I apologize. But it also, I find that it kind of depends on what sphere you're working in. I think that the transplant community in Chicago is very large, and I think that sometimes it's very easy coming into Chicago to not be aware of, um, of the historical situation <laughs> or the climate that you're walking into. Um, you're not familiar with the neighborhoods. You're not familiar with, with the history of those neighborhoods or what you know, what part of that history you are a part of. I know for me, I mean, I live in Logan Square, right? I'm a part of a very specific piece of the history of Logan Square that has happened very, you know, recently. Um, and I think that for folks that are coming from other states, the most important thing initially is to get educated about the community that you're, you have become a part of and making sure that you are holding space for the people that have been there longer than you. Um, and making sure that, I think it's also really, really difficult to, um, this is funny because here I am at the front of the room, <laughs> but I think that it's important to get in the room and then stay at the back of the room and listen, right? Go to the neighborhood meeting, go to the, you know, the local organization and listen, and listen to the people, the residents that have lived here for their entire lives, listen to, to the issues that they have. And then also realize that a lot of the Chicago system is set up to actually attract us, to attract the transplants, right? So thinking about then how to use our power as like a kind of subset of privilege within the city and how to really you know, take our power and use it for the people, for the residents that have, that have been living with us. And I think a lot of times that just comes down to amplifying narratives. That comes down to taking narratives, listening to those narr narratives and lifting those people up and amplifying their voices and making sure that they're being heard by you but also by the person 
that you're connected to by the person who's next to you. Um, it's a very tricky conversation, though, and I have a lot of empathy for you. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, but we should talk. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I came to Chicago in 1973 uh, from a small Midwest town, so I didn't know anything about the city. Uh, I got involved in a volunteer-based tutoring and mentoring program working with kids at Cabrini Green. I've stayed involved for the last 35 years, so I understand an awful lot about these issues. My suggestion to all of you is that you reach out to the different volunteer-based nine-school tutoring and mentoring programs located around the city and get involved. Uh, you can become a tutor, a mentor, you can do tech support, you can do all kinds of different things, uh, but get involved and stay involved. And as you do that, I guarantee your understanding of these issues will grow uh, as you learn them through the eyes and the experiences of the kids and the families you work with. Um, thanks again for you guys not only coming here and sharing the work that you do on a personal level, but also the work that collectively you guys are doing with Q. Um, I guess, can you describe a little bit more of the third phase? So once the issues are prioritized, I assume you'll share kind of where candidates might land on each of the issues, but then once candidates are elected, like how, what is the pressure put on them um, to kind of follow through? We need to pay you and take you with us on the road. Yes. So accountability after the election is the like fourth phase, actually. So the third phase of this is, it's, it'll be a questionnaire to the candidate, so they'll actually be able to respond specifically to every single policy issue, and we'll have all of those responses. We'll also be doing our own research with the help of Ballot Ready um, that will show kind of historically where those candidates have landed. So if their opinion has very recently changed, you will know that. Like in the last month, it's like, hmm, interesting stuff, right? Um, not to tell you how to vote or anything. Um, and then after that, however the election turns out, we'll be using those policy priorities to then check in and have an accountability, I, I'm not sure what it's called. It's like, a, yeah, accountability score or something like that. I can't remember what the term is that we've landed on. Um, but essentially there will be a report that comes out and will continue to come out over the course of the next cycle um, that tells you kind of where these policy ideas are now the different folks who then came forward and said whatever their stance was on the questionnaire, whether or not they've made any moves on it, whether or not it's moved forward. Um, so yes, that is the last part. So I would follow Chicago United for Equity on social media. They probably have an email list. You should get on it. Um, and then you can be in the know about all of these things as it moves forward. I would like to make one more comment. Oh. Because there's something that came out in some of these questions or, or stories that reminded me. Um, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about race equity, Paula laid out kind of these um, numbers and examples. And I think that when a lot of people think about racism, they think about it on the individual level rather than on the systemic level. And we definitely talk about racism at the individual level, but a lot of what we're really working to address is racism at the systemic level. And I think that, especially for the white people in the room, it's important to remember that, you know, you are probably racist, first of all, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, but that also, you can not be a racist, but still be a part of a racist system and a system that is based on racial inequity. And that doesn't make you a bad person, but it does put you in the fabulous position of being able to make serious change. And I would encourage you to do some like deep thinking. And if you're interested, I know Q does kind of race equity um, trainings at different points around the city. If you can find one of those and sign up and go, it's really, really, really great stuff that will super be helpful for you thinking about how race is kind of entwined in our everyday lives and in these systems that don't immediately seem maybe to be about race, but at their core are. So. Thank you.